A dear mentor of mine often says that every Black singer, American or otherwise, stands on the shoulders of Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield. Greenfield not only paved the way for Black singers of classical music, but also for every Black singer who has ever or will ever pursue a professional career in song. Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield was born sometime between 1817 and 1819 in Natchez, Mississippi to an enslaved Black couple, her mother, Anna, and her father, Taylor, which would become her namesake. As a child, she accompanied the mistress of the plantation, Elizabeth Halliday Greenfield, to Philadelphia. This is where the young Elizabeth began studying music. As a Black woman, Greenfield did not have the same career trajectory as other concert artists of her day. Her career was spurred mostly out of necessity after her mistress and former owner passed away. E. H. Greenfield bequeathed $100 per year to young Elizabeth in her will for the remainder of her life, but the will was contested by E. H. Greenfield's heirs and Elizabeth was left with nothing. So she turned to singing to earn a living, as her only other options were domestic housework or being forced back into slavery under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. By 1851, she relocated to Buffalo, New York after spending roughly five years teaching music and voice in Philly. She performed almost exclusively for segregated audiences that were arranged by her manager, Colonel J. H. Wood. In 1853, Greenfield made her New York City debut at Metropolitan Hall. The evening was nearly a triumph for her with an audience of over 4,000 and rave reviews from critics but the audience was segregated with only 20 or so black attendees forced to stand in a separate section. The famed Frederick Douglass petitioned Greenfield to refuse the performance, but Greenfield declined, citing a contractual obligation. In response, Douglass openly published a scathing op-ed. Shortly after the Metropolitan debut, Greenfield made her first trip to Europe for engagements in England, Ireland, and Scotland. However, upon her arrival, her European manager ghosted, leaving her completely stranded abroad because... Probably racism. Greenfield, however, was able to connect with Harriet Beecher Stowe, the abolitionist and author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Through this acquaintance, Greenfield was able to set up a number of European concerts, including appearances for the Duchess of Norfolk, the Duchess of Argyle, the Duchess of Sutherland, and, most notably, a command performance for Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace on May 10, 1854. When Greenfield returned to the States, she still couldn't get admitted into any musical program for further study because... Racism! She responded by touring across the United States, but only traveling as far south as Baltimore. She also opened a vocal studio to teach the next generation of Black voices. Greenfield's touring also reunited her with her former critic, Frederick Douglass, as they traveled the country in collaboration to further abolitionist efforts. In the 1860s, Greenfield developed an operatic troupe that notably excluded minstrels. She died in 1876 in her home in Philadelphia of sudden paralysis. Throughout her career, Greenfield was known as the Black Swan, a sobriquet that transparently compared her to the famous Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale, a trailblazer who endured countless difficulties and setbacks that would be unimaginable today. She was the first Black person in the world to do what she did, which was to establish a cross-continental career in song. <laughs> 